uh, to you for coming. Uh, we have a bigger bus today, but less people. <laughs> but anyway, I, I expect that it is uh, awake people. So I am uh, trying to present the second part of my talk, some experimental approach, uh, and again, uh, completed some ideas that I presented uh, yesterday on on the um, emergent perturbation independent decay, yep. uh, independent irreversibility, perturbation independent irreversibility, and experimental approach to out of time order correlators and Loschmitteko. So let me remember that I was saying yesterday. I was doing this time reversal experiment for many body systems where I create an excitation and, uh, and, and let it to evolve. That's a many body excitation, but it's a local measurement. And then, uh, so how much it returned to the original uh, uh, state. And this, uh, will, from that guy, you'll get a time scale, which is the Loschmitteko uh, time scale, which is T3, is a rate of sort of irreversibility in presence of the environment. Irreversibility or decoherence, because if, uh, it is a quantum mechanical experiment. And at the, and the early experiment that's with, with together with my wife, we noticed that there was this emergence of dynamical irreversibility in this many body dynamics. That means here I have a strong, envirom a strong environment, this will be weak environment, as, as we in the various families of experiments, as we weaken the presence of the environments as compared with the, the, the natural time scale of the Hamiltonian, which is T2, we will go into this sort of asymptotic limit that will go to this sort of perturbation independent decay. That's many body experiment, many body Loschmitteko, our first e experiment. From that, we got the idea perhaps it has something to do with chaos. I, I mentioned the analogy with chaotic electrons in an impure metal. The same idea of Larkin of Shinnikov. That's essentially what, what we did. And with that idea, we went into many one-body case. Because, I mean, spin system, we, we went to one-body case, and we got this, which is more or less the, uh, the actual definition of the Loschmitteko for one-body cases, essentially. You can consider, you create an excitation, uh, a, a wave packet, let it to evolve, make it to evolve backward in times, but essentially with a small perturbation, and ask whether it comes back to the initial uh, wave packet. And it is a probability. So these two, the Benny body, which I, I, I'm not having here, so it was delete, I mean the, the, the expression, many body expression, uh, it will correspond to this single body uh, situation, and it is only in that case where we connect with with chaos where because we have a clear definition of one body chaos. Not, not that clear definition for, for the many body cha chaos as uh, Felix Israelev correctly pointed out uh, yesterday. Ah, uh, here I have my definition, that many body definition. I have a, a thermal state, whatever, low temperature, high temperature. You create an excitation, you make it to evolve with a many body Hamiltonian. You make it to evolve backward in times with a many body Hamiltonian, but with a slight perturbation. And then you detect whether this excitation is, uh, comes back to the initial state. That's, and because it is their field operators, you have uh, evolution at both sides. That's, so the experiment is very clear. That's what uh, was in these experiments. Essentially, since once we were in the, in the one body case, we sort again. I mentioned the case that I have a wave packet here initially. I let it to evolve, and I will go into this, the whole uh, evolved state. And the way to think about this, uh, this quantum evolution is in terms of Feynman uh, path integrals, where essentially the wave packet evolves according to all the po possible trajectories that go from every initial point on the wave packet to the final point. So with that, we have to calculate, uh, to, to build the Loschmitteko wave function, essentially forward in time, backward in time, all the pathways forward, all the pathways backward. And with that, we have to calculate the Loschmitteko. So we have essentially the, the, the two overlaps square. So you see here, we have six integral in space, six integrals in space. 
for uh, Green's functions. So it was a quite a complicated object to calculate. But finally, we devised it that essentially the whole structure here is related to the instability of the classical trajectories that you, uh, they are underlying classical trajectories. And from that, we were able to prove that the Loge Miteko, this one body Loge Miteko, will decay exponentially with an exponential time scale, that's what I now call T3, which will be either the Lyapunov exponent or uh, Fermi Golden Rule rate, whichever is uh, the minimal. So essentially, you will, because it is chaotic, the Fermi Golden Rule decay will be very strong because no selection rules are in the, whatever perturbation you have there, there are no selection rules, and so gamma is strong. And I mentioned yesterday what I will, will obtain. For example, for this case, a single decay, a single system will decay like this. That's a single evolution, just a, a, a single quantum dynamics. You do the ensemble average, you will obtain this. And for different sizes of the, for example, this Lorentz gas box, we will have different saturation times. But essentially, you have many orders of magnitude uh, falling with the Lyapunov exponent. Of course, here we have a perturbation which is above this critical value. This is the Lyapunov regime. This is a strength of the perturbation. If the perturbation is very weak, we will see just the Fermi Golden Rule. So this is the perturbation independent decay that is controlled by the Lyapunov exponent. And there is a plot which is very key to, to this idea of immersion phenomena. And related to, again, to the talk of yesterday, uh, um, about it when these excited atoms do. I have a quantum system. This is energy. As this is perturbation strength. If, it, uh, if I'm in an atom, an hydrogen atom, it's very low energy. So essentially, whatever perturbation I have here, it's, in a, pertur it's a perturbative regime. That's what I mean. If you are in the, in the atom already in a sort of excited state, you easily will go into the Fermi Golden Rule regime. But only when the perturbation is very strong, you go into the Lyapunov regime. But now if you're in an atom in the very, very high excited state, close to the continuum, then you will more easily, and assume that the, it's an atom with a magnetic field, that's a, that's a situation that you know that it is classically chaotic. In that case, you will enter the Lyapunov regime. You see, for high energies, you immediately go for almost any perturbation, almost any perturbation, even for high energy, you will think that the perturbation has to be bigger. No, it's any small perturbation puts you already in the Lyapuno regime, in the classical regime. So classical quantum uh, transition is very clear here because high energy also will correspond to H bar go, going to zero. That's my main my, my point. So the basic idea, this is one body chaos. So I don't know what is many body chaos at all. I don't have a real definition. I don't know what the Lyapunov exponent is there. But I know that somehow, in a real many body case, I immediately in the high energy. For every particle, I am the high energy uh, uh, sort of regime. So my idea is that I go directly into this Lyapunov regime without, because it's very sensitive to whatever perturbation you have. You immediately are this side. You see the Xing and Shang, so the, the good and the bad are together in a single point over there. This could be the thermodynamic limit in many body cases, in many body cases. And this made us to build the central hypothesis of, of irreversibility. In the thermodynamic limit, in many body cases, there is an intrinsic, the coherent regime, which is, will be sort of equivalent to the Lyapunov regime, even when we don't know what is a real Lyapunov regime in a many body case. But we, we think that there is sort of perturbation independent regime like the, like the Lyapunov regime. And since uh, the title of the conference, I'm just going to show one transparency because uh, uh, of uh, uh, Kratzov. Let me consider a many body case where I have a linear chain, a linear chain with, uh, with um, flip, flip uh, XY interaction that that's a Hamiltonian that I could reduce to a single particle excitation. But on top of this Hamiltonian, I put disorder, Anderson disorder, which is an energy for every spin at the side, and also put interaction, which is equivalent to the Hubbard interaction to between nearest neighbors. This is these two terms. 
And then I do an evolution with the Hamiltonian. And then when I do the backward evolution, I put the, this perturbation. So in that sense, I, uh, what, what um, I, I, I mean, I, I do the evolution with, uh, with the both Hamiltonians, but I only invert the, the one body part. It means if this is very weak, essentially let's uh, consider that it, uh, it is, uh, for example, the disorder, we'll, we'll create a sort of scattering, a sort of uh, ergodic uh, situation, ergodic um, dynamics. So initial um, wave packet of an excitation will spread, more or less uh, randomly because of the Anderson disorder. And then I go back in time, but only invert the one body part. So essentially, I will not be able to undo this collision with the, with the disorder or the collision with the other, um, the, the many body excitation. So essentially, I do the average in time of the Loschmidt echo here, and from that I do this plot. So I have disorder here, strength of disorder, and have interact many body interaction here. And I see clearly from this, this plot that there is a, a clear transition here from this ergodic um, region where the essentially the, the, the electrons, the, the excitation spread along the chain to this localized, glassy localized, uh, will be a sort of mot insulator. Here, it's not a real Anderson localization because it's a finite system and there is no actual phase transition. So it actually means uh, that the, the localization length is smaller than the, the chain or bigger than the chain. That's a sort of transition that I see here. It's not a real transition, but a crossover. But you see this sort of, uh, since uh, we were discussing this similar problem yesterday, I, I want to, to, to show it. And essentially, it's ergodicity breaking. Uh, that's the opposite of what I'm trying to, to see in many body systems from the spin echo. So in general, we were trying to see how we could catch this emergent phenomena, this phase transition from the Loschmidt echo. This is not the best example, but uh, essentially we, we managed. This is the theoretical. And the experiments were done by Paola Capellaro. Uh, uh, it was published uh, this year. Um, very much related experiment. They are not uh, as clear as this, but essentially they also observe the transition experimentally in experiments that are related to the ones that I'm going to mention here. Now, let me show, after a while we were sort of thinking about the phase transitions, and we got this example, a second look to this example of our first paper. I mentioned to you that I have a proton system, which are these small balls, the spins are here, and I use a single spin in the carbon 13 that I'm going to transfer forth and back to, from between this, this carbon in order to get a swap gate. I have to build a swap gate to inject the excitation, to transfer the excitation into this system. This is the swap gate in action. Essentially, you put the polarization in the, in the, in the proton, goes to the carbon, back to the proton. That's a dynamic, a pretty nice oscillation. So in order, to, if you want to build a, a, a gate, you actually stop there and then you transfer the polarization that was in the, pro in the proton into the carbon. That was our best uh, gate. But we could rotate this, this, this sample and for different angles we will have different frequencies here. So from these frequencies we plot the frequency for different angles of the crystal and we expected that at a certain angle the frequency will go to zero. And essentially, we will expect that the, this swap gate has an attenuation here, which is the presence of the other spins here that make, will make sort of environment and will create this, this relaxation rate that we, you will observe here. We will expect that as we rotate the crystal, this relaxation rate will be more or less constant. Instead of that, we saw that the relaxation goes down, and we saw that the frequency was practically zero in this region. So we, at the beginning, we were not very much uh, concerned about that because we wanted to build the, the swap gate here, so our parameters were in this region. But after a while, we thought, okay, what is going on here? It was, uh, was pretty strange that these frequencies were going to zero. And then it's again when I, we try to connect with something that was uh, spoken here. Do you know about why are you able to tune the piano? So it's quite uh, strange because in principle, 
you in, the, in a piano, you have this, this arp, you have many chords, and you, you have to tune the chords in order to the, to the same frequency, in order to have a, a sound. But being a physicist, you know that essentially, epa, let's do, ah, well, that I have a single sh shot. It's quite strange because you have a, you have a, a chord that is already tuned uh, the, with this frequency, and you have a, 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 a screw where you're go, uh, going to, to go with the second chord, to you're going to change the frequency until they cross so they are tuned. But since you are a physicist, you will think that essentially two, 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 two oscillators could not be tuned because the, you will go to have an interaction between them and whatever interaction will create an avoided crossings. But the actual thing is that you don't, no, don't get an avoided crossing, but you get a self-tuning here, so a synchronization of the two periods. A synchronization, that's what you see ex experimentally, that will be this, this synchronization, or perhaps it's something which is very, very small here, essentially that's, that's, that could be a, an experiment. Uh, and what is going on? Uh, and with the relaxation, you will expect that as you change the, screw, the, the, the strengths in one of the, the charts, the relaxation will be continuous. But instead of that, relaxation splits branches in two parts. One part with a long-lived state and a short-lived state. And essentially, the basic of this was already catched in, in, uh, by, uh, by Anderson in a, in a very old paper. And where to, to sort of try to, to address this problem, he, he built a Markov matrix, transition matrix, with imaginary elements. That's just a quite phenomenological uh, uh, situation. So the, between the two frequencies, they were exchanging uh, the energy, but they will have a transition uh, uh, probability, which is imaginary instead of being uh, uh, just real. So the idea is that with that uh, element, you will get, uh, let me, uh, you will get uh, essentially um, the, this, uh, this transition. And the, 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 the whole idea is the following. You have a Hamiltonian, you have this, this, uh, this energy, and you have this other energy, and you're mixing these energies. For example, you, you will expect that this, you will have, you know how, what the solution is. You have uh, two, two, two energies in minus V, another in V. But the point is that they have an interaction. One of them has an interaction with an environmental spins. And since you have an interaction with an environmental spin, you have an imaginary part here, which is the Fermi golden rule decay into the environment. Once you try to solve this, this, this Hamiltonian, that will be the effective Hamiltonian for the, for the two st interacting state in the presence of an environment, what you're going to see is that the real part of the frequencies, the, the, the energies that's, uh, that you can do it at home, you will see that as, as you increase gamma, the eigenvalues go there, they collapse into a single one, and they go into, <coughs> they stay being zero. These are the eigenvalues, the eigenenergies of your Hamiltonian. And this is what's going on in our system. So essentially, the two oscillators, that's what happens in the piano, the two oscillators, the two chores, are interacting through the many degrees of freedoms of the piano uh, harmonic uh, box. So they are as an environment that uh, does not conserve the energy, and then you have a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, an effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian because you have a real Hamiltonian, and this is what allows the phase transition. And this is essentially what under inspired Anderson to, to say that is the origin of broken symmetry in nature. That he mentions many cases where there is broken symmetry in, in, in nature. For example, the oscillation in an ammonia, uh, ammonia molecule also. He mentioned in an ammonia molecule, for example, you have a frequency. Then you have hydrogen phosphide, which is a, a, a bigger uh, molecule which is twice as heavy as ammonia, inverts, but only at tenths of the ammonia frequency. Phosphorus trifluoride, uh, again heavier, which is much heavier, is substituted for hydrogens, is not observed to invert. So essentially, in nature, you see that 
uh, at some point, you, uh, the uh, tunneling stops to occurring. And why is that? Because you have an environment. The environment enables this, this um, uh, broke, uh, produces the uh, broken symmetry. And this is a, a, a sort of singular phase transition which occurs in the end going to infinite limit. And what is n going to infin infinite limit here? In my case, the n going to infinity is the number of, a, of a, a spins that are interacting with this one. That's what, what is my environment. So I did the uh, calculations uh, uh, here with um, this is our experimental data. This is time. I'm, this is different orientations of the crystal. So I, I'm seeing the oscillation forth and back, forth and back, forth and back. And that for different orientations, I have different uh, frequencies. And instead, since this is time, I put the, just the top of the mountains here. So you see that this, this will correspond to half the period. And you see that there is a whole region where the period becomes infinite. That's experimental data, raw experimental data. And this is a curve with a Keldish solution for this uh, many body situation that we solve it. Uh, analytically without free parameter that represents the situation because we have the interactions in the in the uh, between the the spins uh, something is dipolar interaction we know very well the the conditions the only thing that uh, in our calculation we have to take also the thermodynamic limit so without fittings this is experiment this is theory and essentially we saw that uh, the spin system actually have this emergent phenomena which are the phase transition, which is quantum dynamical phase transition because there is non-analyticity in the, in the parameters. That's what you're having here. So you have non-analyticity on the freq observed frequency as a function of gamma. So, so, so uh, stop to being, uh, the derivative is not continued there. Now, let me address a bit uh, then about this these new experiments that we are uh, are dealing we want to do this time reversal experiment in adamantane uh, yeah it's the same as super radiance yes the same thing uh, that's uh, di in different contexts like different names right uh, super radiance will be with more states but essentially the same phenomena Right, right. Exceptional points, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, you go into this uh, Northern Michigan Hamiltonian language, that's what you're going to get, yeah. So I said, but th my point is that those things, these phase transitions are enabled by the thermodynamic limit because you need to have infinite numbers of degrees of freedom so they create this sort of imaginary part in the, in the Hamiltonian. Th that's the, what enables the phase transition. In the case of the uh, ammonia molecule, where are the, the degrees of freedom of this environment, which is not considered there, but should be, uh, uh, should be there. So in, in our, this new family of experiment that we have, this is a damantine molecule. We have 16 protons here in this molecule, which is essentially more or less sphere spherical. And these molecules are uh, in, in a crystal, like, a, like oranges in a, in, a, in, a, in a box. So essentially in a uh, BCC, uh, FCC uh, lattice. And with that, we sort of have a ham um, dipolar Hamiltonians again. So interactions, we have flip-flop interaction, you have easing terms, and they have di different uh, relations. And we try to devise different uh, pole sequences in order to scale down this Hamiltonian and in order to, to change the sign of the Hamiltonian. Let me uh, just uh, show again the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian, you have these easing terms, which is this factor three, and uh, here you have a sort of um, uh, Heisenberg terms that part of it cancels the, the, the easing terms, and there, here you have the flip-flop terms, which are competing with these uh, terms, which will give sort of, uh, of disorder, the many-body interactions, this will be so the, the, the dynamics of the spreading. So what we do, essentially, we, what we do is uh, give pulse sequences, so we use this Hamiltonian in different directions, 
So there are parts that it could cancel uh, each other. Essentially, we have two, we apply pulses to let uh, this Hamiltonian to, uh, uh, we're not going to the details, but just wanted to say that you apply pulses to uh, have a Hamiltonian in one direction, a, a pulse and Hamiltonian in another direction, different time scales, until you scale down the Hamiltonian, for example. So I create an excitation with this Hamiltonian, this is the original Hamiltonian, and you see that the, the excitation stays in the side and decays, goes back. This is an overshoot here. That's a very well uh, known curve that, you that this was is described here. But then I scale down the, this Hamiltonian with different periods here. And essentially, I will obtain different curves for different time scales of, of the Hamiltonian. So I have different decays times until I have almost here uh, no Hamiltonian still decays something. So it's what, what happens? I, I try to, to essentially to say my effective Hamiltonian is zero, but there are terms which are not uh, contemplated by this, uh, by this pulse sequence, so no, do not completely cancel the Hamiltonian, so that will be my perturbation terms that essentially stays still decays. One interesting thing is that if I um, put all these this, uh, this, this curves together with this uh, factor in the times, they are all scale essentially with the Hamiltonian with the same time scale. So essentially there's the same curve just shift and essentially attenuated because of the attenuation of the with this thing which is a sort of environment is what uh, mixes uh, a bit the different uh, changes a bit this interference here, but essentially they are all the same time scale. And the same happens with uh, forward and backward Hamiltonian that do we create here, that uh, we are able to have two Hamiltonians, one with one sign and the other with the opposite sign. So we do the backward dynamics, it's also the case. As I was mentioned yesterday, I mean, with the Hamiltonian, you, you go you decay, but you have the minus time, evolution in minus uh, negative time, you also decay, and you also decay scaling. That's the same for uh, doing forward exp in time experiment or backward in time experiment, it's the same. That's uh, essentially is verified here, and both of them uh, scale. Then I'm going to explain a bit our way to, to measure OTOX. So our initial state, as I say, is a sum of polarizations at a gi given sites. Now, these polarizations are completely independent. So they have independent relative phases, the, the wave function. So instead of having the sum, you can think as, a, as if you have a single site uh, a, a polarization. So you can forget about the sum and put just an, an index not here. And this is your, your original excitation in a single uh, site. Now, let's, in order to understand better, let's imagine that in th uh, the Hamiltonian that we have is just the double quantum Hamiltonian, which is a Hamiltonian that has this, uh, this term, flop-flop and flip-flip. That's something that we implement in the experiment. This is called double quantum because from an, an initial state creates a double, and then an another application of the Hamiltonian, another double, a double, and it's creating a correlation, exploring the uh, spin projection of the Hilbert space. So, so you start with a spin one half spin projection and then goes into uh, uh, three halves and so on. So you're uh, uh, flipping twice. In order to think about the time evolution, let's, let's do a short time expansion. So I always think, again, uh, my, my spin system as a kick <laughs> experiment, as a, as a, as a map. That's the best way to think about the, the stuff. So you have the density matrix as a given time, and you want to know what is the density matrix as a, as a very short time later on. So the way to think it, that's, that's the, the evolution uh, experiment of the two terms of the density matrix of the, of the wave function and the conjugate wave function, you have this evolution. But this, uh, this evolution operator, you think as a map, as a in a single time, 
as, a, as if you have this uh, initial density matrix plus the commutator with the Hamiltonian. That's the, the, the lowest order in this term for a short time scale. So that's what you're going to learn. Then you see what will happen if you have this initial uh, excitation with the first term in the evolution. What you're going to see is that your initial excitation that was in a sp uh, uh, spin zero because of the flip-flop of flop-flop and flip-flip interactions, that becomes uh, this, this, this uh, uh, Hamiltonian term. Uh, that's that's uh, the, the evolved state. And the same as this, you have this other term and you have minus minus. That's another term that you have here. You do a next kick, a next, uh, um, a next iteration of the map. The next iteration, you go again, you do the commutator of this with the, with the, with the Hamiltonian. And what you're going to see that you have uh, IZ and min the term minus and the term plus. So essentially, there is no net contribution to, to the spin projection here. But once you do the next one, you, you get, now you get more and uh, more spins projections. So you do this, this commutator. Of you have now four operators. So you have flop, flop, and these two cancel. So you go back to, to, um, to having two flips. But now, in this case, you have two flips and you have one, two, three, four spins correlated. So at, at each time step, the initial excitation, which was in, in a single state, is spreading now between two, then within three. Every time step in your, in your map, you're getting more and more spins involved in your evolved state. That's the idea what this uh, scrambling, scrambling it is. Essentially, for this case and this Hamiltonian, this is you will get a cluster size, so the number of spins that you are involving here as a function of the time steps that you're giving. And essentially, as you see, I have one single spin involved, then go to, go back to zero, uh, but the cluster size now is still three, but the, the order of, that do you call the order of coherence? Because you're going into a collective state that is a superposition between states with, uh, with a very specific phases, because all of these have the phase of the initial state. So they are all coherent. You have many terms like this, many times like this, which are all related, uh, have uh, relative phases which is constant, and it is, this is a, what is you call a quantum coherent superposition state. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what go, we're going to see, more or less. More or less, the people, I mean, the, the people who now is in this talk uh, business, uh, uh, they say that goes linear with time, the number of spins you get correlated. Because, I mean, in these time steps, you are getting once, uh, one spin at a time. And this was, uh, was essentially what I said, I mean, in my linear chain. You remember that I created an excitation, was moving away in the, in the linear chain. That was linear, that's uh, the leave robinson bound that corresponds to the, to the interaction. That's, uh, we saw it experimentally in, in my case. The interesting thing is that in the disorder system, even a chaotic system, the, the, in principle, the number of spins, entangled spins, get, uh, uh, will get the same speed. It's not that the disorder of chaos itself will, uh, will diminish this, this, uh, this time. So essentially, you, you have more times, as many time steps that you have, as many spins you get correlated. And together with the number of spins correlated, you go into this coherence order you're exploring. I think of this like uh, this uh, Galton dashboard. So the, the experiment where you put the, the little balls and then they're branching and then the to, to, to prove the binomial distribution. That's essentially what you are having here. Every time step you are exploring in this, this is a time step. You're getting more and more bigger cluster sizes, and you are also exploring this uh, quantum coherent space. You are exploring the Hilbert space. So you, ha you, you were here, it's just a single spin projection, then two, four, you got here in by pairs, but you're exploring the Hilbert space. 
Well, they say uh, that's what uh, people from this hot talk, they have this, the I, I got it from, from a plot, okay, the excitation goes there, they have more and more and more. It, this is not completely true because they, I mean, here it is that you have a sum of this uh, superposition between these two and these two. So you involve the number of spins uh, you get involved. It is not uh, in a single shot, but uh, your state is a, is a superposition between all those spins, but uh, not all of them at, at a time. And I was mentioning yesterday that the out-of-time order correlator is the correlator operator this is a commutator to the square. This is what they call the out of time order correlator. In principle, as, as before, I have an initial state that is evolving, the initial state that is evolving with the, with the Hamiltonian, and is creating these multiple uh, particle uh, correlations. And uh, because this, um, if you consider Hermitian and unitary operators, this uh, commutator, you can uh, write it as a constant term minus the real part of this commutator, uh, out of time order um, correlator, not the commutator. This is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a particular case of the Loge Mitico, and that's what I'm going to use uh, right now. This is the, the F fidelity correlator, which is equivalent to a particular case of the Loge Mitico. I'm going to, to explain. So again, I'm saying I was decreasing like this, then what I'm going to do is the following. I have this evolved state, uh, um, but this, uh, over this evolved state, I create an excitation, which is I essentially give a Seaman phase. But now this, when you put the Seaman phase, it's different, the phase, the total phase is different for the space with a one spin projection, with uh, three spin projections. So the different projection of the, of the um, of the momentum, the, the bigger will be the phase, because the Seaman phase, because it's the, uh, many quantums of the Seaman energy. So what you do is you create a phase in multiples of, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of a frequency that you, where you're going to do a fast Fourier transform. So you have a, a, a maximum frequency here, a maximum Q, and you use all the multiples of uh, Submultiples of Q, that could be 2 to the n, Q, uh, some number to Q to the n. So you give, you do the, the out of time, this is an out of time order correlator. So in order to do this experiment, I do the following. I create the excitation, I make it to evolve, I put the phase, the phase will be different in the every projection of the Hilbert space. I do the backward evolution and I measure. That's an out of time order. Uh, correlator that I'm measuring here. But I'm doing for, for different perturbations, different phases that depends on this, uh, uh, this frequency. Where so I'm going to obtain different um, correlation functions for different ends. And now I do the Fourier transforms with respect to, the, to this number of ends. And this will tell me how many uh, degrees, so for, for each of these, I, I get, um, I have many, many spin projections all simultaneously, and every one of them will enter with different coefficients here, and I can separate those, those coefficients. Thus, finally, from this Fourier transform, I can get uh, a sort of Gaussian, which is the, uh, I, I, I don't, don't have here the plot, but essentially, I, I, I observe as a, a, a Gaussian, as a function of, of time, for the, for the components of these of this, uh, frequencies. Of, um, so essentially, since they are related to this uh, binomial distribution, I could get the number of correlated spins at each time. So essentially, imagine here, I have an excitation. It starts spreading, while it spreads it also explores the Hilbert space in the different spin projections. Every, every component in this Hilbert space, different projection, has a different phase. I fully transform with this phase, and I know how, what is the weight of these components. And for example, there was a question. If I consider, for example, a molecule with 15 spins, which is a liquid crystal here, 
I do the forwarding time experiment if this is the case. But then I do the time reversal here, I recover. I do a time reversal here, I recover. But then I label these evolutions before the recovery, I label with the phases. That's what I, what I do. So I'm able to know uh, at every time step what are the components with, the, with these different uh, fields. So essentially, um, what I'm going to see, ah, this is echo intensity. Ah, okay. That I will see that the, the component on the original uh, spin projection decays, but then goes, it increases the component in, in the, in the uh, two quantum coherences. That means uh, the other distance in the, in the Hilbert space, then four uh, quantum coherences. Uh, that means that four spins have been flipped here. Six spins have been flipped here. This is this curve. So essentially, the excitation is spreading in the Hilbert space with a wave function that is, uh, keeps being normalized. From these coefficients, I could get the number of correlated spins. And here I see that's, uh, that's uh, essentially uh, what um, scrambling. So the, the information gets scrambled. And finally, here it's completely scrambled between all the 15 spins. And actually, that's uh, new, uh, experimental, so I don't get 15, but 14. But this is an experimental data. This means that the, ex the excitation is completely scrambled over the Hilbert space of the 15 spins here. That's uh, what I wanted to, because it's quite illustrative of what we can do. Right. Linear first. first. But th there is not uh, completely linear because there are time scales here in the, in, the, in the interaction, so it's not completely homogeneous. So you see that more or less th it is following the, the, the network of, uh, of interactions, more or less. Here, that's what it means also this, this, uh, these little bumps, but essentially it's more or less linear and saturates. So let's go to the crystal. No, it's an infinite tree, 10 to the 23 spins. And then again, I have this experiment for different Hamiltonians, and all Hamiltonians say, okay, the number of uh, entangled spins that involve spins by the flop-flop interaction, the point is that the spins are not only entangled by the flop-flop and flip-flip, but also for, by the flip-flop. But the fact that the flop-flop is what allows you to, to, to address how many uh, spins have been involved, because they're with the same time scale. The same time scale for the flop-flop than for the flip-flop. So you're exploring completely the Hilbert space. Here you see of 20 spins, 40 spins, 60 spins, 80 spins, uh, 100 spins, 120, and keeps going on. But we cannot, then the signal is so, so weak that we cannot follow it, but it keeps going up. And what is the law? For this, the number of involved spins goes uh, more than linearly with a time scale to the three cubes. That's perfect fitting here. And essential means that goes somewhat how diffusively in, uh, uh, with, the, with the number of spins. Here, we have addressed already two to the 120 states in the Hilbert space. That's what, what this point is, is meaning. That excitation that was in a single spin was spread into 120 spins, and uh, the, this is the number of states that have essentially been involved. And the occupation is um, essentially by the law of, of great numbers, no big interferences, uh, uh, all equivalent, all the states are equivalent uh, um, address from the uh, initial uh, excitation. So again, now I have this, this, I have said, okay, I have my excitation, I make it to spread. I did the time reversal experiment, I, 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 I perturb it explicitly with a phase, I make it to a ball back, so I, I am able to know how the information is being scrambled. So keeps, uh, keeps going. Now, what I do is that I do this again for different Hamiltonians, and I see, I do the time reversal, my Loschmidt echo will decay 
with the with the with the unscaled Hamiltonian with this. With a, uh, I have different scales rate for the Hamiltonian, 0.42, uh, 0.2, 4, 0.335, and so on. Different Hamiltonians, uh, weaker Hamiltonian, we have a weaker decay. And again, when 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 I um, when I have uh, completely scaled down the Hamiltonian, I kill the Hamiltonian through my pulse sequences, still some terms are there, and I will get a decay. That's uh, that, go, that I, will see, I will see. That could be completely the terms that are outside of my Hamil the Hamiltonian that I control, but the terms that are this uh, high order, that you can see high order terms in a trotter to Suzuki expansion, essentially. And this curve that you see here, it's a, it's a long time scale. This is that will be the time scale of my environment, and this follows your curve, uh, Felix. Precisely, a very good fitting. Start uh, initially with a sort of quadratic, then it goes to sort of exponential. But this is sort of environment. It's not an actual environment because it's, uh, it's a mission uh, still uh, dynamics. It's a Hamiltonian, but it decays. So what I do I is actually use this curve with a zero Hamiltonian. To uh, to rescale to recover what is the, the signal beyond this 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 environment. So my my decay of the Loschmitteko has two. I consider that it has two parts. One, my hint is one intrinsic part, and one part that depends on the environment. And when I take out the, all this uh, this part, all of all curves fall essentially in the same uh, in the same uh, uh, time scale. And I'm going to, to show then this is uh, the, the curve that I'm very proud of. That's now an experimental curve. So as I say here, I have tau phi, tau phi that I, 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 have, I, I know very well I have a constant tau phi because it depends on the, of the, my errors in the pulse sequence, the, the in, uh, time scale of interaction with my experimental errors. And I can cha change the Hamiltonian time scale, T2. And then when I time, uh, uh, and, and I compare my irreversibility time scale with the Hamiltonian time scale. Uh, um, and when I compare this, I, I, since I have this control of, the, of this, time, uh, this time scale and this other two, I can put all the, po the points along this curve. And essentially, when the, when the uh, Hamiltonian terms are much faster than the environment, I can go into this asymptotic. Uh, regime where I go a time scale that I will say then irreversibility time scale which is essentially proportional to T2 with a factor which is uh, uh, essentially around 5. That's what I go see. There are different experiments with uh, different errors in the Hamiltonian and ev even, even different Hamiltonians. So essentially there are two families of experiments here and this point uh, is something that can be, uh, I have still in, the, in this plot, but something that we can, can drop. And it is still another family of experiments here. And so we are seeing this, this curve, that's irreversibility, intrinsic irreversibility in your Hamiltonian. That's, we are reaching that, that's the, the way to, to see the thermodynamic limit. That means, in this, me and what is this time scale? I, I, I will. If I were a uh, one-body system, I would call it a Lyapunov exponent, but it's not Lyapunov exponent. It's the se essentially the second moment of the Hamiltonian. So essentially the time scale at which the, ex uh, the information is spreading, but a bit longer. So like a uh, factor six longer, uh, but it's always tied to the, to the second moment of the Hamiltonian. And this makes us to think that this is there is real a phase transition in quantum mechanics in the thermodynamic limit uh, for number. And this uh, makes us, uh, I found uh, recently uh, um, uh, um, a statement by Steven Weinberg. He said, the class of Lindblad equation contains the Schrodinger equation of ordinary quantum mechanics as a special case. But in general, this equation involves a variety of new quantities that represent departure for the quantum mechanics. These quantities, these are quantities whose, uh, of course, we don't know, though it has been scarcely noticed outside the theoretical community. There already is a line of interesting papers going back to the influential uh, 1986 paper by Giancarlo Girardi, Alberto Rimini, and uh, Weber at Trieste, 
that use the Lindblad equation to generalize quantum mechanics in various ways. So what I'm saying is that once I have the thermodynamic limit in the Schrodinger equation, I will all go sort of go to this sort of Lindblad equation, so a sort of intrinsic irreversibility, because there is a phase transition. It's not that I could, could use this, uh, just this quantum mechanics that I use for a few particle system in, in the thermodynamic limit, because there is, there is non-analyticity uh, uh, properties. It's something that I would like to, to have a real a theorem as, a, as, a, as I have for this, uh, for this one body case. Uh, I, I don't see, don't have it. <laughs> Numerically, it's not easy to, um, to, under, uh, to see this, but uh, essentially we have seen uh, signatures of, of this uh, numerically uh, uh, too. And essentially, that is, uh, I think it is very, very uh, a strong uh, uh, result. Well, let me just summary what, what, uh, I, uh, what are the otoks again. So, uh, the Loch Miteko is excitation, you make the evolution forward in time, evolution backward in time, and you measure. When you do this, uh, when the, this, if the perturbation is just local in time, very short perturbation, then you identify, you can factorize this evolution into, into the evolution of the, of the perturbation, and that's what we did in our experiment, and that's we are able to transform our Loch Miteko into the auto correlator, and this is what we use to measure scrambling, uh, essentially. Here, this is the thermal state, your initial state, and, and a question that appeared yesterday. In on all these experiments, temperature enters in your initial state, but then there is no relaxation at all during the experiment. So if we want to, to, have a, to relax our system, we will need minutes, days, even. That's why people, and that's the error of the I initial Ernst experiments, they put magnetic impurities to make the system to relax, and that's th th they are not seeing quantum mechanics. But in our system, it's completely uh, quantum mechanical. So there is no interaction with the environment in the time scales in, in various minutes, so we cannot uh, repeat the experiment. 